All right. So hello to all the participants that are here with us this afternoon at 4 p.m. CET in Europe. My name is Elizabeth Pulo, and I am going to be the moderator for this webinar today for the next hour or so, which is going to be tackling the financial literacy topic. We have quite a number of speakers for you today, so I really hope that you will be able to enjoy the diverse conversations and learnings that will be happening. What is this webinar really all about? It is a two-episode series as part of the um, Blue Economy webinar, um, which is, and today's webinar will be specifically around financial literacy. This is a project that is being co-created with between J Europe and Euronext. So we're very excited to be here. I believe it's for the four, fourth year running and uh, we've seen amazing results from the previous years and I'm sure that this year will be no different. I would like to introduce the first three speakers to open up the webinar for today. So joining us, we will be having Minna Mellery as our first speaker, who is the Chief of Advocacy and Growth from JA Europe, followed by a short message from Salvatore Negro, our CEO at JA Europe. And lastly, we will have Silvia Andreessen, who is the General Counsel from Euronext. So first up, hi, Minna Mellery, and good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon everyone and a warm welcome on behalf of JA Europe. Indeed, this fourth edition already of the Blue Challenge uh, and the Financial Literacy Webinar with Euronext. Uh, super excited to be here today with all of you. The topic financial literacy is so important for all the youth uh, that you are, the entrepreneurs that you are. Uh, it is a huge opportunity for you to really hear from the experts, from Euronext, from uh, alumni who have already uh, started their entrepreneurial journey about capital markets and financing. And this is key, obviously, to, to your JA uh, journey with your business that you are developing. So we'll hear from uh, very experienced uh, speakers from Euronext. You'll hear stories from JA alumni. Uh, showcasing their journey. But very first, I'm very honored to introduce to you a special speaker, the CEO of JA Europe, Salvatore Negro. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this fourth edition of the Blue Challenge program in partnership between Euronext and JA Europe. Let me thank Euronext for this year edition once again that is bringing together nine European countries, Belgium, Denmark, France, Ireland, Italy, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal and the United Kingdom together. It's targeting secondary school students like you, who participated or participating in the company program and are interested into the topic of blue economy and develop an idea in this field. So what are the objectives of today's webinar? First of all, expand the knowledge on capital markets and what are the financing opportunities for the businesses that participate uh, in the um, secondary school students that participate in our company program. It uh, is something very important to understand the opportunities out there. But it's also uh, a knowledge sharing. In fact, we are going to highlight uh, Euronext role and important in the financial infrastructure and what is the commitment of Euronext to youth education. It is definitely the best in town to learn from. We also want to focus on the JA alumni. We're also going to highlight in this webinar a unique opportunity to hear from our own JA alumni about their different entrepreneurial paths. I want to thank three JA alumni who will be speaking today. Zdananova Lesha, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, entrepreneur and adjunct professor of economics at the University of Tirana and a PhD candidate. Arian Adeli, founder at Evernomic and author of the Quantified Fortune book, which simplifies the modern finance for a young audience. And is a tech speaker, tech speaker and award-winning entrepreneur, Malte Boon Ludvinsen, the founder and CEO at Person Pilot, 
an employee-centric platform that helps employee navigate empathetically at their, be their natural best. We are using it at JA Europe indeed. So we encourage active participation in the live Q&A sessions and I wanted to stress once again the impact and the importance of financial literacy for students' future success. But I also want to thank Euronext, the colleagues of Euronext who believed in this project, this initiative since day one. So we have Sylvia Andresen, the general counsel at Euronext NV, Damien Roger, the executive director at Euronext, Clarissa De Giorgio, head of business development and marketing at Euronext, and all the JA network, the JA alumni, the teachers and the participants who I'm sure will make an amazing webinar. We want to be open. We want to open this webinar to all interested individuals and encourage sharing within the network since it is live streamed through YouTube. I am sorry, I'm not there with you and I needed to send this recorded message. I am in Riyadh in this moment, moving from one place to another. So we didn't have a very good connection, but I wanted to make sure to send the message because you are part of the 6 million young people, the JA in Europe trains and impact every year. Have a fantastic webinar. Thank you so much. You're next. Fantastic opening for today's webinar. And on that note, I would like now to invite Sylvia Andreessen from Euronext to also give us a few words about the partnership and collaboration and about the importance of, uh, of this project and working. Hi, Sylvia. Hi, thank you very much. And can you hear me properly? Yes, yes, we can. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here uh, for the fourth time, indeed, uh, together with JA Europe. Welcome to uh, to all the students and the teachers for uh, the first Euronext Blue Challenge webinar of this year. Um, as uh, Salvatore already said, my name is Sylvia Andreessen. Um, I'm the general counsel at Euronext. I work, I'm Dutch, uh, but I work partially in Paris and, and partially in um in Amsterdam and today I am in our offices in Brussels so uh, a nice international uh, a group and general counsel that means I'm a lawyer but in in this uh, context I'm also responsible for projects like the, the Blue Challenge in, in our company and I'm, I'm very happy to uh, to be here and speaking to you. Um, you may know Euronext uh, um, manages seven stock exchanges uh, so I, and I I assume everyone knows a little bit about what a stock exchange does. My colleagues, uh, Marianne, Clarissa and Damien will tell you much more about, about it. But for us, being in the middle of, of the financial world, we take financial literacy seriously. So li financial literacy meaning talking to people about finance. What, what does it mean? Both young people uh, like you, but also to, uh, to all their generations, because it's crucial for everyone. Um, before we talk about using capital markets to invest your money, we first need to understand something really important. How do we handle money wisely? And, and that is what, what the next presentations will be about. And you are all at a, a really exciting time in your life, full of possibilities. But have you ever thought about what you will do with your money in the future? It's, it's easier than, than, than in, when I was your age, because now you have apps and then you have all sorts of ways to, to handle money. But it, it is very, very important to know how, how to do this. You, you are now the architects of your own lives and planning of your finances will be a big part of that. And starting early is key. The sooner you start learning about money and how to manage it, the better off you will be in the long run. It is a bit like planting seeds in a garden. The earlier you plant them, the more they can grow. So in this Blue Challenge, not only in this seminar, but also in the weeks to come, we invite you to learn about managing money and about investing. We want you to, we want to help you understand your options, um, even when things seem a bit uncertain. And, and especially in the current climate, uh, it, it, there is a lot of uncertainty in the world. So it is extra important that you, you spend your money wisely. So let's start this journey together. We are here to support you together with uh, the JA Europe team uh, as you explore finance and build a brighter future for yourselves. 
So I promise you this is the last introduction. And, and after this, we will really go into the, into the content of, of the webinar. Thanks a lot for joining us. And uh, let's dive into the exciting adventure together. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sylvia. I don't think I could have put it together better myself because I think the topic of how to handle money sounds simple, but in reality is a complex, complex and I think a lifelong journey in how to navigate and starting even from a, from a younger age rather than waiting until we have our first job or sometimes when we have our first loan, which is usually, I think, when we have the first spotlight of, okay, I need to learn how to manage my money. Um, and this is a topic that I believe is very close to my heart. And it's something that the JA we obviously advocate for a lot. And I'm very happy to see so many youth that have joined us for this webinar. But that's it from me. So I think it really is the time to start learning about how to manage our money. And I would like to invite Marianne Alders uh, from Euronext to take us through today's presentation about financial literacy and how to manage our money. Hi, Marianne. Hi Liz. Hi everyone. Nice to see. Well, nice to meet you in this uh, this way. I'm very honored to, to be here today with you, um, Liz. If all yes. goes correctly, we have a beautiful presentation. Yes, perfect. Yes. Um, well, my name is Marianne Alders. I'm a communications manager for Euronext in Amsterdam and in Brussels. So I travel between the two cities, um, and I'm quite honored to talk to you today about financial literacy and personal finance, uh, especially. Because when I was your age, a long time ago, I have to say, um, I was not that financially literate. Uh, I simply did not care because I was living in the present. And then I started working and I actually assumed that I was financially literate. That was really good meant money because I spent less money than I earned. Well, most of the time at least. But spending less than you earn, that's not what financial literacy is all about. Because I didn't have any financial goals, I didn't work with a monthly budget, or God knows I was thinking about a retirement plan. And yes, in the meantime, my salary increased throughout my career, but that still didn't increase my financial literacy. Uh, it only allowed me to spend more money because I earned more. So that's why I'm now truly honored that I can talk to you about personal finance and financial literacy. And we can go to the next slide because at a certain point I've reached this well, point in my life at which I start to look and think about the future. And I start to pay attention to my future dreams. And I think this one is my best example to give you. Uh, last year, I all, of a sudden, uh, I all of a sudden decided that one of my big dreams in life is to actually to travel through Africa, and you'll see me here walking next to the lions, uh, for at least a period of two to three months. But that's a huge undertaking, and it's quite expensive too, especially if you take into account that I won't be receiving any monthly salary. So the question is then, how can I make sure that I can realize my personal dream? And the answer is actually quite logical and quite simple. It's all about setting financial goals, uh, financial goals with different timelines and timelines that keep you motivated, but they will require some discipline and some dedication. So my personal goal is actually to travel through Africa, but for my parents, their goal is different. Uh, their goal will be all about enjoying their own retirement. And for you, your personal goal will com be completely different as well. It will probably or hopefully be all about uh, buying a fancy pair of sneakers or perhaps a more serious one, the funding of your future ed education, or let's say saving for your driver's license. license. But no matter which goal you have, in order to set and to plan and to achieve your financial dream, you need to understand the value of money. And that is actually what financial literacy is all about. So let's go to the next slide. Because the main question in, is this, is does what we know now at this certain age affect your future? And my answer to this is yes, because what you know now day, today affects tomorrow. You will not be able to drive a car without a license that you need to get now. And that is also why you need to begin to learn how to spend your money wisely today. Because if we do not understand the value of money, we will not be able to buy the things that we want to buy or to do the things that we want to do. So second question, 
Does your attitude towards money change over time? Well, if you can take a look at this slide, you will see it does because youngsters, their financial goals will be about getting a few uh, euros to buy Pokemon cards or to buy some candy. For 16 years old, uh, it will be about saving money to buy a designer label top or to buy cool pants or to buy cool sneakers or the latest iPhone, the iPhone 15. For an 18 years old, it can also can all be about uh, uh, getting money to go to college. college. Uh, for 30 years old, well, perhaps they're deeply in love, they want to get married. And for 45 years old like me, well, I do still feel young, but for me, it's time to also think about saving for my retirement. So that means less excessive spending. But one side note, uh, for a 45-year-old to start thinking about retirement is quite late, actually, uh, because that is something that you do not do overnight. And that is also one of the reasons why I want to touch upon this topic today, today with you. And I'm now not saying that you need to start uh, saving or thinking about your, your retirement plan right now, because when you're young, you live in the present. You don't want to think about the future and especially not the future that lies far, far ahead of you. Um, because what you do in the future, well, that's a future problem. And so if I talk, for instance, to my 18 or 20 year old uh, cousins uh, and I talk about them, uh, about retirement pl plans, they will look at me as well as if I'm crazy. In other words, their response then is, well, future me will deal with that later on. No need to worry about it now. And I completely agree but still you have to be mindful. Let's go to the next slide. Um, a funny thing about us humans is that we always want the good things in life and we want to come, uh, them to come logical to us and especially we want them now. And that is also one of the reasons why we love social media that much because social media is all about now and social media is all about having what the other one shows. And Social media is all about believing postings from others, for instance, from influencers on social media. Research actually has shown that uh, at this point in, uh, in time, 23, so that's almost one quarter of young investors are actually followers of influencers, the people who provide you with information about uh, financial topics or banking products, personal finance, or perhaps interesting products or investment products like uh, shares or cryptos. Um, and it so also shows that young people like you nowadays are more likely to listen to those voices on social media instead of back in the old days, like we see here on this slide, uh, an employee from a bank, for instance, or reading newspapers or whatsoever. Let's go to the next slide and let's talk about the power of influencers or the power of uh, influencers as they actually call there are quite many of them and they range from celebrities we can see here kim kardashian of course but also corporate personalities such as elon musk or ryan cohen um, and there are all these uh, ordinary people who just try to uh, give good and proper advice to their followers on social media like youtube tiktok insta whatsoever but the question is should we believe everything they actually say or that they advise? Uh, because when you take a look at all the advice that is given on social media nowadays, it actually seems quite straightforward. Uh, you can learn how to buy a property or a house with actually without having any money. Uh, you can learn the basics of becoming a day trader in 30 minutes. Uh, you can actually learn how to become rich in one day. And with all, the, all these advisors have these different levels of knowledge and these so-called advisors, they've blossomed on social media. And that can be a problem because let's be very honest, if it's truly possible to become rich in one day or to buy a house without any money, wouldn't we all be rich right now? Let's go to the next slide. Because that's one of the problems with social media, what I said before, uh, we see what others have and we go, I want that as well. And I want to have it right now. But the funny thing is we only see the good news and it does make us do and buy things that we see. It is actually instant impulsive behavior without any questions asked. 
Personally, for instance, I keep on buying all these day creams and collagen products as I'm 45, and I still want to look young and radiant. And it really cost me a fortune. And do they really work? Yeah, I don't know. So instead of going, TikTok made me buy it, we should actually ask ourselves the question, what do I really want and what do I really need? What do I really want and need to make my life a success? And that's simple. It's following your own financial path, a realistic one. And there are four things that you then need to keep in mind. Make sure to make informed decisions. Think before you spend. So stop buying day creams, Mariana. Avoid impulse purchases. Similar advice to me. And most of all, make sure that you seek professional advice, especially when making major financial uh, decisions. It has to be all about advice that you can actually trust. And I'm now going to tell you a story. And I'm going to the next slide as well. Because back in, uh, we're going back in history. We're going back to the year 1821. And there was this wonderful, perfect dressed gentleman who actually arrived in London. And his name was Gregor McGregor. And he called himself the prince of an independent state of a country called Boyes. And it was apparently, or according to him, a country somewhere in Central America. Only according to him, because it was completely imaginative. And in today's internet era, we'd have all discovered it immediately, but back then people did not know. Um, so quite a lot of investors were, were fooled by him. So along with his, his partner, he laid down the most wonderful plans for this country. And obviously, you might have well guessed it, it required quite a lot of money. To be precise, 200,000 pounds. And back in the days, that was a lot of money. But then over time, it became clear that Poya's story was a total scam. And funny enough, people reacted quite timidly because all those investors involved in this fraud, they weren't eager to admit uh, that they'd been very greedy and gullible. And so uh, this Gregor McGregor was actually, he managed to fly, to flee back to Venezuela and he lived there in anonymity the rest of his life with quite a large budget. But it's scams like these, these that we have seen through, all throughout history. Uh, perhaps some of you have even seen the documentary recently about the, the Medoff Ponzi scheme from a couple of years uh, ago. All those different types of schemes throughout history, uh, they've uh, have all led to a lot of rules and regulation. And it's a good thing because when there's rules, when there's regulation, you are actually able to make the safe choices um, because it will help you to be able to verify before you actually invest your money. And it will make you cautious of these get rich schemes and other financial scams. Because if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Let's go to the next slide. Because money makes the world go around. And in several years, you as these young entrepreneurs who are nowadays, your generation will be running our world. And you will be the next gen entrepreneurs, the CEOs and bosses, political leaders, uh, perhaps even the boss of uh, several European stock exchanges. But no matter what you become, if you want to run the show, if it's a business or your own personal household, you have to understand money, non-negotiable. Because the world is all about money and people are defined by how much money they have, how much they make, how much they possess and what they do for a living. And so also as an entrepreneur, and that's why we always start the entire Blue Challenge uh, months with a webinar about personal finance. As an entrepreneur, you have to be financially literate in order to succeed. You need to understand how to spend, how to manage, how to budget your own money to get the most profit. And the same goes for yourself, for your own household, be it on your own, living together or having a family. And one of the basic rules, uh, especially for your own personal finance, and we go to the next slide, is one lesson, which is not rocket science. It's all about, let's go to the next slide. It's all about paying yourself first on a personal level. And what does that mean? It means that you need to prioritize your savings in your budget. So when you receive in in income, 
instead of immediately spend it or first paying uh, your, uh, for your car or for your food, make sure that you put some money aside for your own safe, uh, savings. Paying yourself first. Um, it empowers you to plan for the future, make smart spending choices. It helps you also to avoid debt traps and it will help you to actually build wealth, wealth over time. And so we go to the next slide because there are four steps to becoming financially literacy. It's about budgeting, uh, planning on how you will spend and save your money. And your budget is actually uh, your financial compass. But it's also about saving, about putting money aside for future goals. You can actually see that as a foundation for a secure future. Um, but it's also about understanding debt understand the impact of your debt choices. And there's a difference between good debt, investing, but also bad debt, the consumer debt. And credit cards play quite a big role in that. And last but not least, it's about investing. And that's actually the last topic that I want to touch upon today, because we go to the next slide. There are a few ways in which you can, which can help you in order to make your money grow. And that's by investing. And there are quite some common uh, ways to do so, more regular products. For instance, you can put your money on a bank account, uh, create uh, let it grow thanks to interest. You can buy real estate. You can actually invest in gold or wine, perhaps luxury products as a stock uh, as a as a watch, fancy watch, a Rolex, for instance. But you can also go to a stock exchange and invest in products uh, that they offer. For instance, shares, uh, but also the commodities, derivatives, so products that are derived from shares. And there's one last uh, category, and we actually call them or refer to them as exotic or some even super exotic products. And those are products like cryptocurrencies, NTFs, but there are also possibilities to uh, actually buy these specific insurances uh, based on weather or catastrophes. But it's only a very small group in the world who actually does that. And I'm now going back to the last slide because it doesn't matter in what type of product you actually invest, as long as you understand the tool that you're using. Um, and especially the more exotic an investment product becomes, the more important it is to fully understand all these little, uh, the, the entire uh, conditions of this product itself. Um, also for products who do not have a proper regulation, they can become quite unpredictable and quite volatile. And I'm not saying it's a, bad thing to invest in them you can but do always make sure that you fully understand and never put all your eggs in the same basket so try to diversify a little bit because that will help you to spread the risk but full understanding is i think the main key in terms of personal finance and that's it on my behalf wow <laughs> so this really took me to like remembering the main uh, tips and tricks Thanks. and important things to really consider when uh, when thinking about personal finance. And I think a few things really hit home, uh, which are simple simple statements that you mentioned, but it's good. To, I, it, it's really important to remember. I think the first thing was really understanding what do I really want versus what do I need? I think that's such a basic um thoughts to have that's simple asking your question do i actually need this item or do i want it and making smart choices um at the end of the day what what also um really i i really like that you mentioned was the concept of rules to make safe choices because sometimes when um when we have rules and regulations we tend to not feel so comfortable or maybe I don't understand it, but at the end of the day, they they really provide a safety net for the actions, I believe, that uh, that one would, would want to take if it's an investment, if it's in savings and understanding and understanding your finances. Um, I have a question uh, for you, Marianne. If I may ask, like, if you have any suggestions in terms of how would you suggest one navigates through all the information really that is out there? Like how do we identify good information versus bad information? Because as you mentioned, there's a lot of content, there's a lot of influencers, a lot of agencies. Um, how, what's your 
let's say in short, how how what's the first thing that a person should think of to navigate through through all that? Well, what I normally do, or I at least try to do, it's a, it's about a few things. Um, it's about uh, uh, just a, a common knowledge, common understanding. So if, if, for instance, influencers or friends of mine or even a bank director would tell me, Marianne, there's a possibility to become rich in one day, common sense says to me and my intuition says to me, that's mm -hmm. not simply not an option. It's it, That's not feasible. So why trust it? And um, uh, what I normally do, because I can only uh, tell you what I do on a personal basis, is to really try to get as much information and as much advice from different parties as possible. Mm -hmm. Why believe only uh, something that one person is safe? You can also ask five others. Mm -hmm. And then you will find, you, you will see for yourself that there is a, a common line in, within all these types of advices as well. But gut feeling is important. Thorough understanding. So I know that it's sometimes really boring to read the contracts or all the, the background information of a product, but it's better be, uh, to be safe than to be sorry. Definitely. And listen to others. Ask around. Ask others about uh, their experiences instead of immediately jumping into conclusions and immediately buying, uh, well, the very expensive day cream in my case, uh, because I see uh, an influencer recommending it. Fantastic. A lot of wise words, I would say. And obviously from your next, I think no one better to give us fantastic advice that we can trust to make our personal financial journey um, the best one possible. And now we're changing tune a bit and we're going to be hearing a bit more about the personal journeys of some of our own JA alumni. So we have three J alumni who have joined us for this webinar this afternoon, who will be sharing a bit of insight about their own relationship with money and how this has really influenced them in their life. The first speaker we have for today is Zdanova Leshai. Um, I believe you also go by the name of Dana, uh, who is an entrepreneur and a professor of economics at the University of Tirana. Hello, Dana, and good afternoon. Hello, hello everyone. Well, um, hello to every distinguished guest, fellow educators, entrepreneurs, and of course, aspiring financial literate. So as um, Elizabeth um, presented me, I am Zdanova, and I stand before you today, as I would say, a testament to the transformative power of financial literacy. Um, I have been on a journey from academia to entrepreneurship, and I have encountered um, a lot of uh, challenges and opportunities that financial literacy represents. So today I would like to share a little bit of these insights and hoping to inspire and to ignite some passion for financial knowledge uh, and to gain some uh, something from, from this discussion. Uh, I haven't prepared any slides because I wanted to keep it like uh, we're having a coffee talk more. So I will go a little bit deep on my mentoring experience. Um, I'm really glad that I am a mentor of uh, Junior Achievement of Albania for the entrepreneurship program uh, that it is implemented into the high school system. Um, and it's in my point of view, it's really a privilege guiding countless of young minds uh, through actually the labyrinth of financial decision making because each cohort uh, it brings its unique set of ideas and challenges uh, but the underlying theme always remain consistent that it is the pivot, um, pivotal role of financial literacy in transforming ideas into viable uh, businesses so we um, had a really a great group of uh, students, of uh, pupils that had a passion uh, business, actually, but they were finding some difficulties on making it profitable. So when we were, um, um, they were initially overwhelmed by the complexities of budgeting and financial pl planning, but through their journey, they tried and they understand that business ideas uh, to transform into profitable ventures, it is securing their first investments for. So um, you have like steps going through 
And it's filled with moments of doubt and triumph. And really, financial literacy helps to uh, make the way to success. Uh, also, my background, you mentioned it before, I am an assistant professor at the Faculty of Economy, University of Tirana. And through, through my um, experience, I have uh, tried uh, not only to teach to the students theoretical knowledge, but actually um, to provide practical things that it will help them um, beyond their uh, university studies to implement those into their lifestyle. And of course, um, I do, although my background is literally in finance, I am graduated in Bachelor of Finance and Master of Finance, and I'm doing actually the PhD in Finance and Sustainability Development. So, but actually I was uh, facing a lot of challenges um, through my initiative. I am uh, having a startup right now, it's called Narta. It's a platform that it's focused on artists to help them uh, promote themselves and um, those who are passionate to find um, unique arts to buy and to sell and this kind of thing. And uh, despite my academic background in finance, the entrepreneurial uh, path was um, with a lot of challenges and it was, uh, they were unforeseen things. So if I could mention budget constraints to strategic pivots, so each thing um, demanded a deeper understanding and application of financial literacy principles. So this journey was a stark reminder that the learning never stops and that financial literacy is not just about personal or business finance management, but actually it's navigating life's unpredictable financial waters. So I... Um, in my presentation, I prepared also some... Uh, a little bit like delving deeper into the pillars of uh, financial literacy. But uh, as Marianne mentioned before, and the advices that she gave there were immaculate, so I wouldn't add anything. Um, I hope it's been helpful what I've been presenting till now. And um, everyone, good luck on your journey on financial literacy. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dana. Um, I have uh, I have just a, qu a quick comment or a question. So if you had to give one advice, especially based on your startup journey, because you have a background in finance, but you still face yeah. challenges when it came to implementing it um, in your startup. Right. So what kind of mindset or what like what's the one advice that you would share with uh, with the participants here with us today and on the live stream? to to kind of not give up especially in that treatment because money makes the world go round at the, i think at the end of the day so it's important to learn how to navigate it and have the right way of thinking and approach without letting it hindering your dreams yes 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 um every component it's um, it's really important on uh the journey when you go even dealing with everyday life and especially when you are embarking on an entrepreneurial journey. So um, the first component that I would mention would be absolutely budgeting uh, to personal financial management because it's um, like building blocks toward financial autonomy and responsibility. And then you go and deep, um, go deeper into investing and then risk management and things like that. But I think that if being uh, really clear on the concept of budgeting, it will help you uh, go through unforeseen challenges that it may happen along the way and it helps you adapt along the way. So that is, it was the most uh, concerning thing and the most um, important thing that um, allowed me to go safely into the road of uh, entrepreneurship. Super. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and your insights with us today, Dana. And I'm, I'm, I just want to pinpoint for anyone who's, um, who's here with us today. Feel free to drop any questions that you may have for all the speakers that we have in the Q and A. And at the end, we can go through them and ask the speakers to reply to any questions that you may have. So now we are moving to another speaker that we have. We have Ariane Adeli. Hi, good afternoon. 
Hey everyone, my name is Aria and I'm very, very happy to be here today. Uh, I've been told about the 10 minute limit, so if I go over it, please feel free to, to give me a nudge there, but I'll try mm -hmm. to keep it under, hopefully. But um, a brief introduction, I'm currently living in the Netherlands and working on a venture studio called Evernomic. We have a focus on media and software-based startups and now manage almost a dozen startups. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with what a venture studio does exactly, we develop frameworks and systems and knowledge bases which we then apply to found and support various different startups in relevant niches, of course, as efficiently as possible. Uh, now, I began my career at 13 uh, when I coded virtual self-driving cars on a national level in Iran, where I'm originally from, and then moved to Cyprus, where I founded my first startup. Uh, we developed investment software for the masses. I then joined uh, J Cyprus, the company program there, where we founded Quick Meals, a food tech startup, to help you find the best recipes from ingredients you have around. That was a big problem for me as well. Apologies for the, for the ambulance in the background. We live next to a hospital, but uh, yeah. And it, it helped you find the best recipes from ingredients you had in your fridge because I, I couldn't figure out what I wanted to eat whenever I was hungry. Uh, I then joined the board of JL and my Cyprus as the community manager. Uh, our board came just as the network was being reestablished. So we were working very hard that year. And the year after I become, became the, the national coordinator of the board, which unfortunately didn't last very long because we had some internal issues with the JA offices. It was a short time, but a good time for sure. Um, and I had moved to the Netherlands by the time I became national coordinator. Um, in fact, all the other projects I had previously had been either shut down or sold uh, at that time when I moved to the Netherlands, except for JA alumni. Um, and we built the network from zero and meant a lot to me. Uh, I met some brilliant people along the way, got some great ideas. I began working on Evernomic as well uh, during that period and shortly after moving to the Netherlands, uh, which was almost two years ago. Now the, the rest is history. But just a bit about uh, the roles that, let's say, financial literacy has played in my career personally. Uh, well, first things first, Evernomic is bootstrap, right? We have no outside funding. So naturally funding a dozen startups out of your pocket can be uh, difficult. It is very difficult and it has to be done deliberately. I won't get into the technicalities and the formalities in this talk. I'll try to keep it very personal and as unique as I can. Uh, but the reality is running such a business means efficiency is of utmost priority. And by extension, we don't really have time for, for formalities either. And on, on a side note, to be fair, this is what true financial literacy looks like. It's sort of a subconscious understanding of how to be financially literate, right? Not memorizing some rules to live by and sort of moving accordingly. Now, in the most basic sense, it's not really about whether you can afford something or not, for example, uh, not even about, you know, the rules, the rules that we hear that like if you can't buy something twice and you can't afford it, it's not even about that. It's about also the opportunity cost of doing it. So for every thousand euros we spend, for example, there are a dozen other projects and startups that are stripped off of a thousand euros, not to mention that there's about a hundred different ways to spend that money on each of those projects. So even if you can't afford that sort of capital, it doesn't necessarily mean that you should spend it, right? Because you have to also look at what else you could be spending it on. Now, uh, specific sort of examples of where, I guess, financial literacy knowledge made a significant impact on my decisions. Uh, one thing I can talk about is a strategy that we've implemented in our budgeting. And in that sense, it's sort of favoring one-time expenses over continued ones. Now, to give an example, in October last year, we acquired a media project that specializes in sharing new startups with a large audience. So we have over 10,000 people that wait for our recommendations every week. And we opted for acquiring this project as opposed to spending money on, on ad spend for our other projects. That was actually the opportunity cost. Now, could we afford both? Yes. Now, why did we make this decision? It was because with ads, we would have to keep spending money on and on continuously. And in the long run, the numbers would keep adding up, right? And that makes it considerably harder for us to finance. Whereas now we have a cash flow generating asset that also enables us to promote countless projects for free indefinitely. Now, I guess the lesson here, it's hard to put it into words, but essentially we chose uh, the long-term sort of benefits of it, even though we didn't immediately get the benefits that ad spend would give us on the other projects. Now we have a very, very valuable asset. So it was sort of forward thinking as well. Another example is that now we're launching an ad network. So you own? Okay, come on. Is that all right? Yeah. Uh, now we're launching an okay, ad network, yeah. and essentially that's that's connecting creators okay. and advertisers together, uh, and that's a marketplace platform, right? So with a marketplace platform, one of the main problems, the most fundamental problem, is called the chicken and egg problem. Essentially, it's like who, because there's two sides to the story, right? So advertisers and creators, who do you go after first? And that's the main struggle that uh, the firms in this niche face. Google had it solved because 
naturally they had the consumers from a free search engine and then or YouTube, etc. And then they brought the advertisers. Uh, now, obviously, for, for a private organization to try to get into that business is considerably harder. What we did was months ago, we acquired a, a authority directory where people would submit their projects that are audience based to newsletter directory. Um, and now the benefit that has not generated a single penny for us. Was it a financially smart move? Not in that sense. But now because of having that asset, every time someone from anywhere in the world goes out and starts a newsletter, the first thing they do, they send us an email telling us about it. So we have all their email addresses, right? And now, now when the ad network launches, then we can reach out to them and say, hey, so we've got the creators already. That's a benefit that you can't necessarily put into numbers, but I've learned that uh, sort of the, the intangible the benefits that certain things provide, it's worth considering as well. And um, at the end of the day, it's such a broad field of discussion when, when it comes to financial literacy. The fact is money is simply a translation of other people's time and effort. And a person is rich, quote unquote, if their time and effort is translated into more of this invention we call money than the average joke, right? So you need to you need to look at your time as an investment as well. Everything you focus on must have a tangible or intangible benefit that you can observe in some sense. Um, and this affects my decisions on a day-to-day -day basis as well, even when my wallet is not necessarily in the question. Um, now, since we're on the topic with Jay, et cetera, uh, how we incorporate sustainability practices in our, in our business, that would uh, be a bit of a hard one to answer, to be honest, but most of our businesses are digital, so sustainability isn't exactly a topic of discussion in the traditional sense. Uh, we define sustainability as, as ethics, and we're ethical in every way we can. For example, as sort of the parent company is Evernomic, then we only reach out to startups and potential clients that want to be reached. We have non-compete agreements, so we don't sort of betray existing partners we've got. We don't make fake promises, et cetera. But for our media projects, for example, we have no spam policies. We don't send emails or we don't push out content to anyone that hasn't given consent, GDPR compliance, et cetera. Um, now, sort of key learnings and failures uh, that I've had, if I had to sort of point out one, uh, it would be to consider the ch churn rate and also the growth of your business very well when you're sort of budgeting and planning for potential investments. That churn rate uh, is sort of the rate at which you use, lose users, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's something that you don't pay for, obviously, and it comes regardless. You can't stop it naturally. The goal is to try to minimize it, but there's always going to be some level of churn rate which comes uh, and is guaranteed to come, right? Uh, now, what you need to do is get, you need to have a sustained growth that comes free of charge without any ad spend that beats this trend rate, right? Because otherwise, you're just trying your best to, to fight a decline as opposed to boost an incline. And that's one thing I, I learned, and it was a mistake that I made in the past, that I used to spend a, a lot of our capital on advertisements, which used to work in the moment, but at the end of the day, we weren't on an incline, we were always on a decline. And then our growth was sort of binding on the fact that we need to raise more capital, which is part of the reason, you know, the startup culture now is go to VCs, do this, do that, and to raise a lot of money, which is not necessarily um, the path you should take. It doesn't apply to everyone anymore. Obviously, some business models need it. But this is one lesson that we learned that sort of tried to sustain the growth as much as possible. Um, and then you sort of expand through ad spend, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so Ariane, have, you, gave have me, I reached the 10 minutes? you gave us a lot of to think about, I have to yeah, say. Yeah, all right. I, I got no, a lot of questions. Right. I tried to it's, answer what I could. It's, it's been brilliant to, to listen to the journey. And I think uh, if, if I can just highlight maybe one thing that kind of really <laughs> struck home for me, and I think is important to consider, especially when uh, looking at startups and starting something, it's that to consider, correct me if I'm wrong, the intangible benefit as well, because sometimes we might look only at the financial aspect, but it's good to think long term and look at like kind of the time, the benefit and the benefit is not always financial, but in the long term, it can benefit you, especially from a goodwill point of view, or at least the impact that you can have, the the value of the organization, the perspective um, of the startup. Super. Yeah, you have a lot going on, I have to say. <laughs> but Thank you very much. a lot for us I, to learn from as well. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I got the questions. I thought I answered them all. I wasn't sure. No worries. No worries at all. I think you did a fantastic job. I'm thank really sorry much. to have to cut you off. Uh, no problem, no problem. But I and thank you. Thank you again for joining us this afternoon. And no now problem. I would like to move to our Last J alumnus, uh, Malte Brun Ludvigsen. Hi, Malte, and good afternoon. Hello, hello there. Good afternoon. Did you? How are my you doing? Slides? What I said to you. 
Yes, so I believe we have a couple of yes, slides. Great. Yes, my colleague. And uh, how much time do I have left now? So okay. we have around 10 minutes. Um, 10 minutes. So we're still on time. Um, okay. And uh, yes, yes. I'll, I'll leave this for you uh, okay. so that you can close off today's webinar. And uh, if you can just give us also a quick introduction yes. about yourself. Next, next slide then. Uh, I can't control the slides. Okay, so uh, very brief. There are, I know there are a lot of bullets here, but a very brief about me, introduction about me is that uh, I've been part of the JA program for three years. Uh, I started the, uh, the JA Alumni Denmark, uh, co-founded it back in 2003. Uh, yes, uh, I'm part of the mentorship program that someone mentioned earlier also, which is uh, highly recommendable. Uh, I've started companies. I've tried the corporate life and I started companies again and I'm part of a few boards. Uh, as mentioned uh, earlier in the introduction, I'm, I'm founder and CEO, CEO of Person Pilot. And most importantly, I'm married to Marit and we have three daughters and we live in Denmark. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, I'm, I've decided to follow some of the points and questions that you send out as organizers that we could uh, be inspired by. So I'd just briefly like to touch about uh, upon the J experience I've had. Um, the J experience really provided me with some certainty in terms of what I wanted to do. Um, uh, I guess I've always been uh, inspired by entrepreneurship and so on, but actually taking part in the company program made me certain uh, that that was my path and passion. Uh, needless to say, uh, through my involvement with the J alumni and so on, there have been many experiences that have been provided many opportunities to me. There are investors now, and I've learned that. I know that uh, we are now starting a pre-seed, uh, a pre uh, uh, uh network, a venture network, which is a great thing. I think also for uh, yeah for people to succeed. So that's great. I've gained a lot of friends through my J experience, and I even gained family. My wife that you see at the bottom here, I I met uh, because I uh, I attended a, a, a conference in Tallinn where I represented Denmark because of my uh, J experience. So I've had, I mean, it's really shaped my life in many ways, being part of the J uh, program. Next slide, please. So uh, financial literacy, to be a little bit more on, on topic here, I just I do this very quickly. Uh, I just like to, to say that it, you know, financial literacy plays a role in, in, in failure also, because you need to know when to fold as well. So it might, uh, you know, help you make the right decision, even when the right decision is to actually shut down your company. Uh, if you're starting a company, when you're starting a company, that's really tough business. And if we talk about budgeting, you need to uh, you need to be flexible and agile, um, and actually relax a little bit on your um, financial literacy, literacy sometimes, because when you budget uh, as a startup, you just have to change things all the time. Um, and that is actually an educational experience because it uh, it helps you reflect constantly on your numbers. Um, of course, financial literacy is also important when you communicate with your team, investors, and bank. They need to know that you understand your business. So, uh, so that's important. Uh, and I would just say the impact of financial literacy is a daily thing when you're an entrepreneur and also other you know other professions. But I'm focused on the entrepreneurship. Uh, ankle, um, because it's uh, yeah everything fluctuates. Uh, it's uh, you have to be agile, so uh, so you have to be able to 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 make decisions wisely, fast. Next slide, please. Yeah, sustainable sustainability in business. That's actually at the heart of what I work with on a daily basis because um, we essentially want to help people perform sustain sustainably over time. Um, and we, uh, uh, you know, no matter what you want to do with your, what, what, no matter what you spend your time on professionally, being able to perform sustainably over time is, is really uh, crucial um, because otherwise you will not succeed and whatever you, you try to create will not happen. Um, so we, we, uh, the, I've set up this, uh, this uh, kind of uh, cause and effect. And with Person Pilot, that I'll get back to, we work on empathy helping people become more empathetic towards themselves and each other because empathy is really uh, important for authenticity uh, we need to understand ourselves in other, uh, and each other to be able to to uh, empower auth uh, authenticity in ourselves and others and we know that if you are uh, authentic uh, can be authentic at work it will 
it will boost your engagement. We also know that if you can't be authentic, you will become disengaged very fast. And being disengaged is not sustainable. It uh, it will uh, it will lead to inferior performance. You will burn out. You'll quit. You'll be laid off. Um, yeah. So obviously not a sustainable uh, path. Um, next one, please. Next slide. Yeah. And actually, if we talk about engagement, it's not really looking that good in, in Europe, especially, but also other parts of the world, because according to Gallup, 87% of uh, the workforce in, uh, in Europe is, uh, is uh, disengaged. And that's actually catastrophic when you look at it, both from a financial and, and human perspective. And we need to do something about it uh, fast, I would say. Um, next slide, please. And that's... Again, I'm not making a big plug for person part here, but that's actually what we work with. We try to help people become more empathetic towards themselves and each other so that they can be authentic, therefore engaged, and thus also be able to perform sustainably <clears throat> over time. Next slide, please. And failures. <clears throat> ah, I've had many failures. I've tried a lot of things, um, and uh, some of the failures have been very painful, some less painful. Uh, but all of them, I would say, have been educational. Um, failure really sucks, um, but it sucks less if if you learn from them. Uh, we all make mistakes. Uh, we'll fail miserably, and that's totally okay and human. Uh, but learning from them is uh, really uh, important. That's the key. Next one, please. Next slide. Yeah, so one of my failures, uh, very painful and more recent failure I had was... Uh, with uh, Plenty Play, which I spent a lot of years on. We produced and sold toy construction systems uh, and we had game centers, we had distributors, we had place to runs where people could get a wholesome experience based on Plenty Play and eat and so on. Uh, and I spent numerous years on that. Um, and uh, we, yeah, we, we had a good business going on. Uh, we had diff uh, detailed plans and, uh, and budgets and so on. And you could really say that we were uh, very financial literate in our way of approaching business, but we still ended up failing because uh, despite all our literacy, the pandemic uh, with the hard and never ending lockdowns came and totally uh, crushed us. Uh, and that it sucked us dry uh, uh, essentially. And, you know, all our activities were in China. So, you know, maybe from, from media that they have had very long and very tough uh, uh, lockdowns. Uh, so I lost a, a fortune. It was very painful, both mentally and financially, but I learned from it. And uh, yeah, and uh, you move on, right? And it led to to person pilot, essentially. Uh, next play, slide, please. Just uh, uh, here, last last slide, actually, is just a, a few tips for success. Uh, sometimes people say uh, practice makes perfect. I, I think, by the way, there's not, no such thing as uh, perfection. But I would say uh, passion makes perfect. And the reason why I have my, my daughters here to the left is just that I, that's the advice I give them. I sometimes have discussions or talks with my two oldest daughters there. Uh, they uh, tell them what they want to do when they grow up and so on. And, and I say, whatever you do, you know, it has to be something you're passionate about where you uh, where you can actually be authentic and be yourself because otherwise you will never uh yeah, you will never be, uh, you never have uh, real financial success either, and you'll not have st stability in terms of financial uh, financials. Um, so make sure that you do something you're passionate about. And uh, easy come, easy go. Uh, there will be phases likely in our lives where we make money a lot easier than other uh, at times and other phases. And my, my advice would be make sure that you don't, uh, spend money very easily when you make them easily. Try to make spend money in a way the same way you would if you earned them in the real hard way uh, because times go, you know, they're good and, and bad times. Um, need to have, nice to have. I think Marianne touched on that uh, in the, at the beginning. Um, I, my experience, and I'm 42 now, uh, is that uh, really the, you know, buy what you need and not the nice to have because my experience is that you over they just clutter your uh, your world if you uh, if you buy too many things that are nice to have you will regret it eventually um and uh, i'd say the the best things in life are, are free right that's a, such a cliche but it's also very true uh nature take care na nature is out there uh it takes care of your mind so plant some trees and dig holes and move earth that's 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 my advice that's what i do 
Um, and by the way, for entrepreneurs there that might be out there, don't start alone. Uh, it's uh, some people do. I've tried it also, and it's, it's very tough. So preferably find someone who is different from you, who can do other things than yourself, uh, whom you have good uh, chemistry with. Um, starting a company is not a very rational thing to do. So you will need help. You will need passion to 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 muster the energy to actually continue and and and, and succeed. Uh, you know, essentially to survive as a business. I think that was my very quick uh, presentation here. Yeah, well, that's it. Uh, reach out if uh, and uh, if you feel feel so inclined, connect with me on LinkedIn. Yeah, that fantastic. Was it. Thank you very much, Malte. I think you had you made a fantastic job of kind of closing off this this webinar for us today. You touched upon entrepreneurship. You touched upon the personal. Um, personal journey and something that uh, I, I I really liked from what you mentioned is learning from our failures. It's not something that I feel we talk about enough, but this is the moment when we can kind of really learn and move on in, in our journeys. And sometimes something better comes out of it. So kind of really striving to keep going. Um, there's help out there, which is something we also mentioned in the beginning around the, the choices and decision of financial literacy. So thank you once again for, for joining us in this webinar. And I believe we are right on the dot for our one hour. And this brings us to a close for today's webinar about personal finance for the Blue Challenge program. And I would like to invite you as a closing to join us for our second episode, which will be happening on the 6th of March at 4 p.m. CET time, where we will actually be talking about the blue economy. So we will be talking a bit more about the oceans and the wildlife and understanding the value of it and why businesses should protect it. I think it will be a really great follow-up to today's webinar. Thank you once again for joining us today, both on Zoom and for those who joined us on the live stream. Thank you and good afternoon.